Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to today's webinar on process monitoring and automation for SMEs. Uh, my name is Mark Whelan, Programme Manager at Enterprise Ireland, and I'll be your host today. So just before we start, um, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, th this is our fourth uh, webinar in the series, and it will be recorded, so it'll be available next week for you to go back and view afterwards if you want. Um, and you'll also see the first three in the series on that channel as well if you want to go there. Uh, today's presenters are Tanmay Swaroop and Kieran Doyle from IMAR in uh, Monster Technological University. Um, and they'll be giving about a 30-minute presentation on uh, the two issues we're going to talk about today. And after that, we'll follow it up for a Q&A session. So you'll be able to see at the bottom of the dialog box, there is a question section. So as we go along, feel free to add your questions there, or you can ask them at the end. Um, so uh, without any further delay, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Kieran, who's going to take off first, followed by Tan May. So um, Kieran, over to you. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, I'll just start by introducing uh, uh, IMAR Technology Gateway here in Tralee uh, in Munster Technological University. And we have uh, 35 researchers working with industry on a number of uh, technologies. Yeah, so um, the technologies um, we cover uh, apply to different solutions. So uh, robotics, monitoring and autonomous systems um, serve to reduce costs and improve quality and so on. Um, radio frequency identification tags, uh, embedded systems and the Internet of Things applied to smart factories, uh, connected devices and so on, and software systems, um, artificial intelligence and virtual reality applied to things like online commerce, uh, digital services and uh, virtual training. So process monitoring is basically it sensors, the data you get from the sensors, communicating that data to where it needs to be, and then the analytics to present it in a kind of a format that's that's usable. So what it does is it gives an oversight, it provides a, an operational dashboard, and it aids maintenance and improvement, and it enables remote monitoring, which is an imp important point as well, to, um, remote both in the sense of you know hard to reach in, in, in a factory or whatever, and also over, over distance. On the other hand, then, the process automation is about machines to replace or complement manual tasks. Um, this does is it reduces repetitive or dangerous or awkward tasks. Uh, so it's not just repetitive as these other, other issues as well. It ref frees resources then, of course, for higher value activities. And it gives consistency both in terms of the final product and in terms of the process. So the trend is, is called uh, Industry 4.0. Uh, it includes cyber-physical systems, Internet of Things, cloud computing, and cognitive computing. Now, cyber-physical systems is robots and also uh, closed-loop uh, automated systems. And cognitive computing is referring to the fact that computers are increasingly able to make decisions that in the past only human beings would have been able to make. Uh, so all this adds up to the smart factory. So the reason for adoption, well, the, first of all, uh, Ireland is is adopting at a reasonable rate, but we're, we're very far behind the, the world leader, which is South Korea. Uh, by sector, you can see that it's uh, handling is nearly 50% of the cases, but, but if you add handling, welding, and assembly, you're nearly at 100%. And the triggers for adoption, wh why would you invest in these things? Well, the obvious one is reducing cost, but you can also do things like increase worker safety, and you can also tackle um, labour shortages if, if, if there are such. So uh, this is a slide just on the EU uh, view of what the future holds. I reckon about 50% of tasks globally could be automated. 40% of workers' time could be freed up. Uh, by 2022, which of course is only next year, 4 million industrial robots are expected to be in use around the world. Uh, investment in industrial robots will grow 10% a year, which means a, a doubling in, in, in seven years. So the, the fast rate of increase and you're more likely to automate highly routinized work with limited social interaction although that itself is changing as well so there we go the eu research development and investment strategy has artificial intelligence as its, as a core element uh, of automation now the industrial internet of things is internet connected devices and it ranges from tiny centers all the way up to complex robots uh, it's applicable in a, a, a wide variety of, of settings. And IoT, is, it's for business, and it's more robust, it's more reliable, it's more security conscious, as well as being more bespoke and more um, um, specific than consumer I, IoT. 
So perhaps this graphic shows it uh, pretty well that um, consumer Internet of Things is basically gadgets and the industrial Internet of Things is basically tools. So process monitoring in real enterprises is all about uh, becoming more flexible and agile uh, and re reacting to market changes. So KPMG estimate that over two thirds of companies worldwide plan to implement IoT and um, you know, they, they, they feel they have to. Uh, so this is a kind of a list of the um, categories of um, uh, use cases by percent. Now, process monitoring in practice, sensors are key to process monitoring. It's really all about sensors. Uh, so you can fit them on a cell, a machine, or a plant, and sensors give a voice, give the process a voice. Much this, what this means now is that um, the sensors can be made to give the information that you really want, <clears throat> you really want about the, 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 the cell or whatever. And part of the reason for that is that the, the number of variables that can be monitored is, is very wide now. So, you know, environmentally, you can detect gas levels, noise, uh, amplitude, and also you can use directional uh, microphones vacuum levels, temperature, and in the physical case, you can do strain, acceleration, vibration, electrical, um, you can do magnetism, power consumption, and more, and chemical, you can even do color and, and acidity. So a wide variety of, of things that you can monitor. So process monitoring in, in, in practice, IoT hardware, is, is, they're easily deployed sensors. They do data capture, obviously, they have wireless communications very often, don't have to, but in a lot of cases they do. Um, so you get, and you have cloud storage, and then with the cloud storage, then you can inform uh, mobile phone apps or dashboards on your computer, and of course, analytics to analyze the data. So you, you start with the sensors and we end with presentation to the user. Now I'll, I'll run on to the uh, uh, couple of case studies we have. Uh, case study one was a PC assembly stress monitoring case where a client needs to satisfy um, its customers, automotive customers, that PCBs were not being overstressed during assembly. So we need factual data have to be required, factual and time-stamped data have to be provided. So IMR implemented a string gauge technology into the manufacturing process, providing data to satisfy uh, third-party requirements. So you can see on the graph there that this isn't just a case of uh, it's, it's being permanently stressed, but even, even um, uh, transitory stress was of, of, of interest to the customers. Case study two, machine monitoring. The business need was to minimize factory downtime, so they wanted data on vibration and electrical current. See, predictive maintenance like that, especially for machines, is very important because the machine can seem to be okay and then can fail fairly suddenly. So you need a lot of uh, consistent or constant data coming back. So IMR provided a solution based on wireless vibration and current sensors with minimal modifications to the machines. So the data analytics provides machine health monitoring and maintenance dashboards. You can see that you know we we interfered minimally with the with the customers' actual machines. Case study three then is an IoT solution to leak testing, where a plastics company need to, need to, they need to test leaks in the, the waste processing containers they sell uh, because you can't you can't go in and maintain them afterwards. So we devised a vacuum testing system based on wireless pressure sensors placed inside the containers and obviously using wireless to get the, the data out from in there. Case study four then was uh, uh, in healthcare where a client wanted four days from a therapeutic device to optimize treatment of athletes. Uh, this was funded through an innovation voucher. Um, and IMAR built a system using four sensors and a microcontroller to gather timestamp data and send it and put it in the form that the, the doctors could use with their obviously completely different expertise. So you can see from the picture as well that um, that's a 3D printed little um, uh, box that was used to contain the microcontroller, the uh, sensor board and the little battery. Case study five then, hazardous waste track and trace in pharmaceutical plant. Uh, Astellas, they, they needed to minimize risk by tracking hazardous pharmaceutical waste from creation uh, to site exit. So it was a case of optimizing the waste handling process. The solution had to be compliant with regulations, with US regulations, in fact. Uh, so this was funded through an EI uh, innovation partnership. So IMR developed a hardware uh, radio frequency identification wireless track and trace solution, uh, provided the middleware that would be the microcontrollers, a back-end database, uh, and an analytics dashboard. And case study six then uh, is IoT based storm messaging. The business need was an enterprise resource planning software company needs to access data from a customer's plant for reporting because that's a, that's a customer of theirs. So there's actually three entities involved in this, IMAR, the software company, and the um, um, 
uh, factory owner. So this was funded with two uh, EI innovation vouchers, so NK, and IMR developed interface in the database used open source software, uh, which is very important for cost limiting because you know, um, bespoke software can be very expensive, um, achieved high impact with low cost and deployed a real time uh, interactive dashboard. And you can see from the dashboard there that you know uh, temperature numbers, for example, are color coded to sort of give a quick indication to the operator of potential problems. And also you can see that there's historical data there. So uh, that's it. We're uh, IMR, we're part of uh, the Applied IoT Technology Cluster. Uh, Tom is the manager. He's at Chiefs Morris at technologygateway.ie. And there are other state funded centers as well. And there's this is uh, Horizon 2020 fund, uh, funding is something to think about as well. So I'll hand over to Anne now, uh, who will cover process automation. Hi, uh, thanks, Kiran. <clears throat> so uh, to start with, uh, uh, we have put together a definition of automation because there are a lot of definitions available over the net, which emphasize mainly on uh, reduction of human intervention. So to harmonize the thoughts that we carry on during our discussion today, our definition of automation is, Application of mechanical, electronics, and intelligence systems to reduce waste, monitor, and control production. So with this in mind, uh, let's move forward and see what are the different components that can be involved in automation and what are the different types of automation. <clears throat> well, uh, when we think of automation, we think of complex machineries. But depending on the task, various hardware elements can be integrated using frugal te automation techniques like a simple linear actuator and a cobot can help in easing the PCB assembly or a vibration sensor to detect any abnormalities in machines. These are automations. With, uh, with this, let's see what are the different types of automation we can deploy in our organization based on our requirement. Uh, types of automation. Well, to understand different types of automation, we need to refer to this graph, which is plotted between production volume and product variety. So the first in the graph, we see programmable automation, which can be used when we have high product variety, but low production volume. These systems are capable of creating wide variety of product parts, but with slower rate of production. Example of such uh, automations are CNC machine, which can be programmed to, product, to produce uh, product varieties, but a limited rate, and prototyping using 3D printing. Next we see is flexible automation. This type of automation has the capacity to produce a spectrum of products with next to zero downtime and no complicated changeover procedures, which means greater production rate. Example of this is electronic PCB uh, assembly, uh, material handling system, and automotive uh, assembly lines where variety of parts get assembled on a single manufacturing line. Next is fixed automation. In this, uh, specialized equipments are used to automate fixed sequence of assemblies, example, <clears throat> uh, food uh, manufacturing, chemical pa uh, paint, and coating industries. <clears throat> Few more examples of these automations are programmable automation. We have CNC wood carving, where you can upload different types of designs and carve them on the wood uh, as we need. For flexible automation, we have industrial robots, which can be programmed to uh, give us different tasks. <clears throat> Fixed automation, machine for seamless pipe. This machine can produce only pipe at higher rates, but uh, with different diameters upon changing the dies. So these are a few examples of uh, programmable, flexible, and fixed automation. Now let's see how do we approach towards automation. As quoted by Bill Gates, the first rule of any technology used in business is that automation applied to an efficient operation will magnify the efficiency. The second is that automation applied to an inefficient operation will magnify the inefficiency of the operation. So uh, how to select the right process? For that, we can take the following steps in our organization. We can start with 5S techniques, which will give us organized and clean workplace. Once 5S activities are complete, we can calculate our internal or external customer demand time, aka tech time, and our process time. And if cycle time is greater than tech time, we should do line balancing 
but if uh, even after line uh, line balancing process time is ahead of tuck time we can do motion time methods or Maynard operational sequence technique. This will help us identify ergonomic issues in our line. Uh, also, this will help identify different type of waste in our process and eliminate the same using Kaizen's or uh, continual improvements. MTM or most can also help us identify Pokayoke opportunities in the process. If this process is still not uh, able to catch up with tuck time, then surely it needs automation. So with this understanding, let's see what are the benefits of automation. <clears throat> First and the most uh, is the increased worker safety. As we can see in the data published by health and safety authorities in Ireland, showing the areas where number of non-fatal in injuries have happened is during material handling. So by implementing automation in our warehouse, we will keep our employees safe. Few other benefits are uh, lower unit cost by automation, <clears throat> improved quality through fewer defects, uh, known and reliable quality, greater productivity and higher throughput, consistent and predictable th uh, throughput, greater precision and accuracy, reduce inventory. These are few of the benefits that we can list down, but there are many others. Now let's see uh, some case studies where IMR was involved in the automation development. In this uh, case study, <clears throat> uh, our client uh, needed uh, to automate the process of material handling to improve component quality and in wor working environment. A uh, solution was developed by IMR as demonstrated in this sample video, uh, funded uh, by an innovation voucher. So in this, you can see robots were adopted to load the material into press and uh, unload the semi-components from the press. So this was, yeah. So this was used to eliminate uh, workers going into dangerous areas and to speed up the process and the quality of the products. Uh, going to next case study. Uh, where uh, cobot uh, for PCB assembly. So the client required automation for PCB assembly process to improve quality and working environment. Uh, this project was funded uh, under innovation partnership. So IMR developed automation solution using dual arm uh, uh, cobot as demonstrated in the sample video. So here we can see what kind of cumbersome job it is to do a manual assembly. So you can see uh, that the components are placed. Here is the solution that was developed by IMR, where, where we are using Cobot for quality and inspection <clears throat> and assembly. And uh, here is the Cobot doing the PCB assembly with minimal changes. Going to next case study, uh, this was an uh, swing automation. Business seed was uh, to automate the swing process for manufacturing of cleat for filter elements. Solution, this was funded by an innovation partnership. IMR developed a solution using two automatic swing machine as shown in this uh, sample. So this is a manual pleat, oper pleat swing operation, which is, uh, this is a speed up process, which is showing over here. Uh, otherwise it's a pretty slow process and a cumbersome one. So the solution which was provided by uh, IMR is an automated uh, pleat swing solution. So here we have we are using uh, two automatic uh, swing machines and an automated system which helps uh, to manufacture the pleats. That's the video where it has taken the pleat and then now the machines will sew. Yeah. So these were few case studies what we have. Now I'll hand over to Kiran. Thanks, Hamid. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, 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 IMR were part of the uh, Applied IoT group in the, uh, in, in part of the EI Tech Gateway system. Um, and just to mention as well that there's there's other groups who are, would be of interest in terms of um, robotics and so on. So the Irish Manufacturing Research uh, confirms smart manufacturing and of course um, a lot of stuff going on in, in agriculture as well and, and the introduction of um, 
robotics and so on in, in farming is a is a, a growing area. So uh, just to reiterate, we're part of um, the EI gateway system. So there we are, MTU, Early Intelligent Mechatronics and Radio Frequency uh, Identification Tags, uh, or identification, um, um, and you can see the Nimbus in Cork, for example, and Command up in Athlone and Wise Out in uh, Kenny. So uh, there are other uh, technology centers that work with companies as well. So you can see uh, uh, other um, uh, entities there that um, can, can support uh, people. So that's it. Thanks very much. Um, just to say that we covered uh, process monitoring and we covered uh, process automation. So uh, the process monitoring is something that we would suggest um, is easy to get started with and uh, can be very um, uh, can give a good give, give a big payback. Uh, and automation is something that I think it's just coming. So um, it's uh, it's incumbent on all of us to. Um, Try to be ready for, for what's uh, what's going to come and be a part of it. So I'll just um, put a couple of uh, email addresses there and leave it at that and say thanks very much. Thanks, guys. So, so maybe uh, you've been very efficient with your use of time. So maybe I'd, I'd give you the opportunity to go back and ask you a couple of questions on some of the case yeah. studies to maybe flesh them out a bit more before I go into some of the questions we have. So so maybe tell me if you on, on case study seven, could you just to give people some detail on how long would it take to carry out that type of project you know and and how much work does the company have to contribute so i mean is that work that happens in the factory how much time do you have to spend in a factory doing that or how much work can be done in the research institution so maybe you could just give, give some background on that please yeah so what we can do is uh, we can start to monitor the process uh, first what is the manual process and then design a solution for uh, this uh, and then uh, we uh, do the simulation of uh, such uh, process uh, in uh, the cad so before bef be basically before investing uh, into the actual uh, uh, automation uh, we go for the simulation and then see what are the solutions uh, available once the solution are uh, uh, good enough and then are uh, efficient uh, to handle the pro kind of uh, process and the kind of goals we are looking at uh, then we go for an actual uh, procurement of that uh, uh, equipments uh, hardware equipment so this is uh, there would be a minimum uh, monetary loss when we actually go for the process and uh, implementation of automation so yeah uh, for these kind of projects uh, we are looking at around uh, uh, 18 to 24 months so to complete and uh, some of the projects like uh, some of the activities uh, uh, like uh, programming uh, if the equipments are small around the robot as a small then actually we can do it in uh, the IMR itself we can start the programming and then we can do a prototype over here in IMR and then we can actually shift this working prototype to the industry so but it's totally depend on kind of equipments that are surrounding uh, the robot yeah um Thank you. So, so in terms of maybe then the sewing one, obviously, uh, how, how long might that have taken by comparison? Uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, uh, this uh, kind of automation uh, doesn't take uh, much of a time. So it's like uh, a twelve months project uh, that we can complete within it. Okay, Th thanks for that. And so, so maybe Kieran, for yourself, I was just looking at case study two. Um, would you like to talk about? I suppose. You know what what what's the actual work that's necessary in that what are the type of sensors that you use again how many sensors how do you decide what sensors you would use in that um and again maybe what what time level does it take to to carry out something like that well that, that was a project now that only took um a, a few months the, the the key there is 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 vibration sensors because um the problem with vibration is that um, it, it's something that happens very slightly, and then all of a sudden there's there's a there's a, a, a rapid deterioration in the in the machine. So this is a, a great example of why predictive maintenance is better than preventive maintenance because preventive maintenance would be periodic investigation of um, potential faults. So you know there's a gap in between each each investigation, and in that gap. Uh, some uh, catastrophic failure may happen. Whereas if you've got uh, uh, IAOT, you've got a constant stream of information and you can, you can pick up even slight deteriorations in the performance of say a machine. 
and you can catch it and you can um, make sure that you replace it before it causes downtime. So that, that's kind of like your classic statistical process control in effect, what you're doing there, you're looking at, you know, a, a number of things and if they start to go out of control, that's giving you the, the warning yeah. in advance, is it? Yeah, yeah. so it's, a, it's not long before it's an actual fault, you're, you're getting an advance warning. Okay, and, and just could you pick up then on like what, what type of sensors did you use and, you know, how how cheap are those sensors? How readily are they available? Or do you have to do you have to design unique sensors to go and do that? Or is a lot of this stuff off the shelf? Oh no, it's all it's off the shelf. The well, the vibration sensors would be a little, little bit, um, maybe um, um, around maybe a couple of hundred. But the the, the current monitoring sensors are are very cheap. They're um, and they're very they're very off the shelf and like they're physically very small as well. So again, the, the ease of deployment is something I wanted to start to emphasise there as well. Um, you know, because you can kind of, um, you, you can uh, attach the vibration sensor on with, without having to do major work on the on the machine. And also the, the current sensors are very easy to deploy. So I suppose the short answer is yes, they're, they're, uh, those sensors are, both types of sensors are quite cheap and quite easy to deploy. I, I, so, so then obviously very little downtime on a line if you're going in to, to, to upgrade it with something like that. Oh yeah, for, yeah. Well, you do have for the current. You do actually have to. Uh, well, no. Um, you can have these clamp um, uh, ammeters as well, so you actually don't even have to break the uh, the electrical connection to uh, introduce the, the sensor. Sometimes you do. You know, if you go in line with a with a current sensor, obviously you have to break the the line, so you'd have a short down downtime. But if you use these um, external, you know, you, you sort of essentially wrap it around the the, the wire or the cable. Uh, you can measure current that way, and in that case, you you haven't uh, you haven't interrupted the the process at all. And that's the same as same is true of the um, the the um, the vibration sensors. It, it can be possible to put them on. Uh, um, okay, you have to take safety into account, but I mean it's a very simple and short uh, thing to do to put the vibration sensor on. Okay, and and maybe could you talk a bit then, just finally on on the last one, case thirty four about the the I, IoT in in healthcare. I mean that's. That it seems like a very niche um, thing. It's, it's obviously funded through a voucher. So again, maybe you know, could you just talk about a bit more detail of what 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 was needed there and what you did? Yeah, well, um, the the um, the analysis that that they needed to do, um, I suppose there was a little bit more in, in, in behind it. They they um, they were using something else to um, to measure uh, essentially the the weight of a person on the on the on the on the ground, um, so it, it kind of in, got integrated with other things. But um, the 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 advantages of it were that it, it's it was um, it's it's very small. I, I think perhaps the the picture doesn't get across just how small it is. Like it's um, almost you know not much bigger than the actual size of the the picture on the screen. You know, um, so again very cost effective. Um, and uh, quite robust, you know. You, there's a there's a top goes on. That said, we we have three D printing capabilities as well. So uh, we were able to make this uh, little three D box. And what you do is you screw, you screw the top onto it, so it becomes a a, a robust little little unit that can can sit on the the um, um the, the unit that the 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 athlete was was um uh, uh, training on. Um. So I think I. I, I I suppose you could call it niche, but you can sort of see that um, um, it has a lot of the features that you might want in other types of, um, of application because it's um, it's easily deployed. It's it's kind of it's 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 mobile as well, you know. And um, the battery lasts a surprising amount of time, you know, for such a small battery, like you, you get nearly a week out of it. So, what what kind of injuries would somebody be recovering from to 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 utilize something like that? Well, these would be um, well, basically sports injuries, you know. So you're 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 talking about sort of rehabilitation kind of exercises, to um, because there's, there's there's issues about how an athlete an athlete can sort of recover the right way and can re recover the wrong way. Um, there's a there's a thing where um, this is a big problem for what the doctors were trying to sort was um, you can you can overstress, you know, the say the bone. If, if it's a broken bone, you can overstress it as well as understress it. If you understress it, the athlete won't won't recover uh, uh, quickly enough. But if you overdo it, it kind of causes other problems. Now, I, I 
I'm not a doctor, so I don't um, I don't really know the you know the, the medical ins and outs of that. But that was the point. They had to sort of pick a uh, an optimum kind of um, rate at which the the uh, athletes would would train to get them get themselves back into um, the peak condition. Okay, excellent. So maybe I, I start turning to some of the questions we come in from people. So, what types of software platforms have you encountered in process monitoring projects? And are there emerging trends or lots of different solutions available? Well, um, we, we tend to use uh, microcontrollers a lot. So, um, um, stuff like the, um, the embed and the Arduino, um, and sometimes something like that. We've used the Raspberry Pi as well. Uh, and we also, you know, we, we can kind of access, um, well, they're easy to access, this kind of cloud solutions available on the net, which can certainly, um, uh, certainly initially, anyway, you know, when the uh, development phase makes it very easy to kind of uh, get the data, make it available, and uh, also turn it into, you know, produce a dashboard um, kind of easily and quickly. Okay. So I, 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 the same question to both of you, because I think it, it, it probably, I'm not sure which it is, so I'll ask it to both of you. So if a company is new to this area, what, what's the first thing they should do in, in, in terms of thinking about implementing? And it wasn't clear whether it was supposed to control our automation, so I'll ask you both. So maybe Tanmay, if you'd go first. Yeah, so for uh, automation, uh, what we can do is uh, we can uh, uh, use uh, some of the softwares like uh, SolidWorks, uh, CAD, uh, which are the, some of the CAD platforms, Proe, and uh, then we can do the factory automation uh, using factory CADs and uh, Katia. Uh, these are some of the CAD softwares. And then for the robot simulation, uh, like for uh, ABB, we have a Robot Studio. Uh, for uh, uh, Fanuc, uh, there are uh, some other uh, robot simulation uh, uh, softwares which are easily available over the net. Uh, and uh, you can actually contact uh, these uh, robot manufacturers and they can give you the license uh, for that. Uh, and then you can actually uh, use them and understand their capabilities. So yeah, we can do uh, such kind of uh, simulations. Okay, Kira? Yeah, I would say on the process monitoring uh, that, um, you know, it's it's easy to get started. And obviously, uh, people themselves know the, you know, they they know their own the, the problems that they have in their own uh, situation. So I would say that, you know, they might be surprised at how much help they can get from from the whole um, area of of process monitoring these days. Because, um, you know, they might be able to uh, build a system that's that really um, gives them the information. You know, the the missing information. If they get the information they're missing, you know, it's. It, there's there's so much variety in in how process monitoring can be done that I think you know people people should really sort of uh, investigate it and maybe contact us you know and um, just see if there's if there's some way of of solving because you know the problems will all be very different but if they can be certainly to get started uh, is kind of easy and and um, quite cheap you know. And I, I suppose that, that you haven't really ever come across a case, or have you, that you know you couldn't help somebody using process automation or stuff, have you? No, well, one doesn't. I would say one doesn't come to mind. No. Uh, okay. Good. 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 Yeah. Um. So, can you maybe expand expand then on the benefits of of acquiring that data? Because a lot of people will have heard about Six Sigma and quality improvements. So, there's a question there about expanding on the benefits of that in in, in supporting Six Sigma projects that that people might have in their companies. Um, yeah, basically, for uh, I'll I'll try to yeah, just start yeah. with basically to just uh, for Six Sigma, uh, everything is all about data. And then if you have data uh, uh, which uh, uh, which you need uh, which you need to gather uh, from the equipments that you have uh, into the system, <clears throat> so that's one thing uh, where you can start uh, process monitoring for. So yeah, see part part of it as well is is um. You know, the, the, you know a lot of data, but it's also it can be very timely data as well. So you know, you can you can intervene a lot quicker with um, with process monitoring. But you can have this whole predictive maintenance concept, which means that you're not kind of waiting around and um, doing a you know, even even quite frequent investigations. You kind of find that there's, there's been a problem there for a while, and now you have to fix it. Whereas with Six Six Sigma, you're trying to uh, well, part of what it is is that you're 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 trying to push out 
Like Six Sigma is this whole idea that you're way out the, the, the bell curve, right, right out at the edge of the bell curve. So there's you know virtually no faults at all. Sort of nine is it six nines is talked about sometimes as well. That you're trying to you're trying to eliminate um, faults in, in in product and uh, uh, breakdowns in, in um, process. Um, and the way to do it is to get lots of data and get it get it in a timely manner. Yeah, and if you have a proper data, then you can even tighten your uh, control limits to to produce and uh, lesser defects uh, from the process that you are monitoring. So these kind of process monitoring equipments can help us uh, do attain that. Okay, you, you talk about a lot about the data there. So how do you help companies make sure they collect the right data? Because you know w w one of the things you hear about a lot in discussion is that you know it, it's you know people have so much data they don't know what to do with it, and data mining is obviously a big thing now. So I mean, how do you help companies to kind of ensure they're looking at the right thing? Well, uh, on the process monitoring, thing, what what um, what we have been able to do, see the the the, the customer knows the customer knows his problems. You know, he, he knows what he's he knows what he's trying to fix, and um, you know it, it comes down to discussion and basically, um, can he can he you know if he asks, can he get at the information that he wants? And it would be a lot of it would be the choice of sensor, you know, uh, the choice of uh, physical quantity that you want to measure. I, I know what you're saying. Like, I mean, you you could just have a um, uh, an ocean of data, and it's it's no good to anybody. But the the uh, the the point about a lot of the process monitoring is that it's kind of driven by you know it's driven by need. So you know the, uh, the somebody who's manufacturing someone will sort of say, well, I have a I have a particular problem or a particular area where I don't really know what's going on. So um, can we get a sensor in there that will uh, that measures the right quantity to, to tell us um, what we need to do? And I suppose that that's the expertise you have down at MTU, isn't it? That you know you have the the, the wealth of researchers in behind you who can help companies understand yeah. that and decide what's the best one. Absolutely, yeah. And we we kind of um, we like to emphasize as well, you know, that um, you know we've done big ro robotic projects, but we've done small projects as well. So you know, kind of um, we sort of done, we've done the the whole thing from from small to big. Okay, so then. So that that was another question there. So I mean, what what you know is there a particular size of company that this is more applicable to? I mean, do, do you have to be doing a certain volume of a product, a certain amount of something to make this useful? Well, I'll let Sammy have an answer on the robotic side, but yeah, uh, actually, if uh, if you see the graph what I have shown in my one of the slides, uh, like uh, where uh, the automation can be applicable. So it goes uh, from uh, low volume to high volume, and a uh, lot, a lot. So if you like, if you see, if you have a very low and uh, low volume and uh, low product variety, then you might stick to manual methods. But if you were anywhere uh, between, uh, I, uh, I mean, uh, if you have like fifty thousand uh, volume, uh, then I guess uh, you should start considering uh, your automation. So it's actually not uh, stick. Uh, it's not uh, any uh, like you can stick to some particular size of the company, so you can actually start with anything. But 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 the volume of what you're producing, you're saying there is important, and you, you mentioned fifty thousand as as a kind of a threshold where you start thinking of automation. Yeah, so uh, it, it, yeah, it's sort of dependent upon the kind of volume that uh, you have in your uh, process from your process. Okay, all right. And Kieran, does does that question relate then, as opposed to to process monitoring as well? Is there a a certain volume of product you you need to be doing to be able to make use of of that, or or does it does it matter? Well, I think in the case of process monitoring, it, it's it's um it's um uh, quite variable because you know to get started is something that's that's really quite cheap. You know, um you know obviously you know you can get more and more um. Uh, sophisticated maybe about the security of the data and, and uh, uh, amounts of data and so on but you know really quite small companies have, have um or even you know relatively big companies but perhaps they've you know done fairly small projects with us as well as as, as some of the more medium and, and and larger projects um like i say i'm trying to just it's it's you know the concept is just that you put it you put a sensor there you gather the data you you do something with it and you uh, present it in such a way that um the, the operator or the manager uh, can do something with it um, and you know that really can be um, very small or, or 
uh, quite large. And, and, and doesn't necessarily always have to be a, a sensor, I assume, either. I mean, certain things could just be manual measurements in the same way that the types of automation Tanmay is talking about there. So some of your data collection might be manual if it's very low volume, would it? Oh, of course it would, yeah, yeah. Um, and indeed, sometimes, you know, you might even take a, a bite-sized sort of approach to something. You might say, um, we'll, 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 um, we'll work on the sort of the, the control side of it first, and we'll, we'll use um, manual input of, of data to get us, get us started. Um, and then um, later on then might say, well, you know what, we can, we can add a sensor in now so that we can, we can measure the data with, with a sensor instead of, instead of typing it in. Okay. You know, we, you know, weight is a good example where you are um, identifying, say, an object you want, you want to measure things. And you might say maybe there's some kind of serial number. Um, you would enter the serial number manually, and measure the measure the unit, and then later you could sort of say, well, let's put an RFID tag on the on the units, but that would be stage two. So you would have a, you would have started uh, really simply and really cheaply, and moved on then to something a little bit more sophisticated. Okay, excellent. So look, um, th thank you for that to both Kieran and Tanmay. Um, we're, we're we're coming up to time, and I, I I don't see any more questions coming through there. So. Um, <laughs> Before I, I finish up, um, I'd like to thank both Kieran and Tamne for, for today's excellent presentation. Um, just to let you know that the next event will be on the 24th of June, 11 a.m. as well. Uh, the topic will be Energy Optimization and Innovation for Business, presented by the, the Credit Gateway and Dundalk IT. Um, and you'll see registrations open for that next week. Um, so just one last thing before I go, I'd like just to pay particular thanks to Aideen Hennessy, who was a an intern working with us in Enterprise Ireland for the last 10 months from Manute, from Manute as part of our work experience. And, and Aideen is the person who's who's probably done most to try and organize all of these and, and do all the IT work behind it, get it all set up. So just like to say a, a big thanks to Aideen for, for all our help uh, with us over the, the time on that. So again, thanks to everybody for today and hopefully see you again on the 24th of June.